The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Carrie Ouskaros here with realagriculture.com. We are back here today with another Canola School episode, and I have here with me Aaron Day, who is the Assistant Professor of Soil Physics at the North Dakota State University. How is it going today? It's going pretty well. How about yourself? Great. Where are you guys at um, in the seeding season? So right now we are uh, kind of right in the middle of things. A lot of folks have planted uh, corn getting into soybeans, although a lot of farmers are also seeing how much land potentially might be going into preventative plant acres uh, that may not be able to make it in within the uh, crop insurance uh, windows. So it's a it's an active time in the field for farmers in between the rainstorms, but it's also a, a active time for making some tough decisions for this season. Yes, absolutely. So we are here today to talk about some of the research you have recently published on soil compaction. Can you highlight some of the things you found? Yes. So, you know, soil compaction has been a big topic this last winter. Uh, here in um, the region where I'm at, we had a very wet 2019 year. It started wet in the spring, which delayed planting, uh, which put the risk on the back end now for harvest. And sure enough, we had some pretty substantially wet conditions during harvest. A lot of acres actually ended up overwintering um, and are still being harvested uh, right now. And so fields that were able to get harvested in the fall, if it was done early enough with some of the smaller grains, then perhaps uh, there was little risk of soil compaction during the harvest. However, for uh, corn and soybean and other grains that were harvested late in the year, they uh, uh, was not ideal conditions. Many fields, uh, quite prevalent throughout the region, had you know combine and way wagon tracks uh, uh, up and down the entire length of the field every single pass. And one of the things that we know through research and um, just not in this region, but anywhere region in the world pretty much, is that if you have ruts that form, then you know you have deep soil compaction. And that is gonna have some form of a yield consequence, not only for next year's crop, but also for the year after that. Most soil compaction issues, it's a multi-year recovery. So typically, no matter what the crop is, whether it's a small grain, large grain, um, if you have deep soil compaction from wheel traffic, you can anticipate probably anywhere from, on average, a 15 to 20% yield loss for that next one and two years uh, that's going to follow up afterwards. So long-term, how long can these impacts stick around if producers aren't actually doing anything about compaction? So once the compaction initially happens, it's going to take a couple years to recover, almost no matter what you do. Um, because usually when you have ruts, the compaction extends down below what your tillage implements, typical tillage implements are going to be. And even if you have something like a deep ripper that can reach down uh, 16 to 24 inches or so, it's still highly unreliable with it actually getting the outcome that you want uh, for bringing yields back up. It's just not a reliable tool for deep compaction like that. So the first two years, almost anything you do, you know that you'll have a loss. So that's something that's you know unfortunate. We just don't have a useful tool at our, at our disposal to deal with it, but it's something to keep in mind for when you're going out on wet soils. The best way to prevent losses is to prevent the compaction occurring in the first place, other than relying on something to try to remediate that compaction. After that first two years, compaction consequences on yields usually lighten up. It's, it will go down to maybe uh, 10, 5 percent. It may disappear altogether. However, uh, one thing that we do notice 
in repeated trials of research is that even when the yields recover, on the years that you may hit excessive rains again or drought conditions, those compacted fields, it'll reemerge. You'll see another 5-7% drop in yields because of this longer term uh, uh, compaction issue that can actually extend well up to a decade. So would growers ever be better off in the long run by leaving the crop out versus so you don't make those ruts in the field? I think it's it's worth asking that because, you know, depending on when you harvest and when you have the opportunity to sell that grain, the, the market prices will change a bit. You know, do you have the capacity to store it or not, uh, depending on the markets with some supply and demand. But, you know, how much loss you might get over the winter from seed chatter or uh, from wildlife, um, you know, feeding on the standing grain out in the field, you know, one has to start questioning, does letting it over winter equate to 20% of next year's crop and 20% of the following year's crop? Because that adds up quite a bit. Uh, so in some cases, it may be worth letting it over winter giving it time uh, but that'll have the local context of, of the, what the wildlife is around you what kind of crop you're in and how easy it is for that seed to shatter as well as uh, you know what your region's history is with uh, grain diseases uh, when they overwinter. So um, can you talk a bit about the concept of how you actually measure these ruts and how you measure compaction in your field? So the, uh, when you get ruts, you know you have compaction. Uh, uh, once you go out and you level those ruts off with some tillage equipment, because you have to fill them in and smooth them out so you can get something flat and even to plant onto for the next crop, the compaction below that till depth is going to persist. And usually what we recommend is to not dig below the depth of the rut because usually that soil down low is it's already compacted, it's wet. And the worst thing you could do to a compacted soil is actually then start smearing it over. Uh, it just makes conditions worse. And so one of the ways to see if compaction is still out in the field the following year or the year afterwards is actually taking something like a, a common uh, soil penetrometer. It's just a, a very simple uh, device. It's, it's a rod with a cone on one end and a pressure gauge on the other. And you can press this into the ground. And as the gauge changes, the higher it goes, the more compacted that soil is. So you could go out into a field. And if you know where your traffic lanes typically are, you could actually kind of go across where the direction of your uh, plant rows would have been. And if you go along every plant row, every other plant row uh, in between them, and you go down and suddenly, you know, most of them, you're not seeing any severe compaction, but then suddenly you're like, oh, there's where that rut was down below. And then it's gone again on the next row or two, and then you see the other tire set. Uh, then that's a, uh, an easy and efficient way of telling is that deep compaction still there? Absolutely. Is there anything else you would like to add or any messages you would like to send to producers when it comes to compaction? So one of the things with compaction, at least in my mind, is, um, you know, as a soil physicist, I think about how things move in the soil and how that affects our production. And so the best case scenario, the ideal soil in my mind is one that not only holds your equipment up on the ground uh, and doesn't sink in, but is also one that simultaneously drains the water away well. And that is a, actually a, a, a hard combination to get uh, in a lot of systems because of our current technology that we use with tillage and other means, we're typically making the soil soft, but then when we drive back over it the next time, it compacts down and now it doesn't want to drain as well. And so it's this kind of back and forth tug of war in between 
making the soil firm, but yet drainable, making it softer, but yet now it doesn't drain for it. So in typically, you know, finding uh, a system to where you have the least amount of passes on your fields to help prevent the likelihood or just the chance of compaction to occur in the first place will also help your soil develop the pore system to be able to drain that water away. That'll make it easier to drive on yet the next time again. And so, do you have any numbers as far as uh, yield loss you'll actually face if you're not taking compaction seriously? So if you have a field that wasn't compacted before, you can have anywhere from a 9% up to a 55% drop in yields for that next year. Now, on average, that usually evens out to around that 15-20% range in yield loss that you can get uh, for just about any crop. It doesn't seem to be crop specific. All It's actually incredibly consistent <laughs> um, cross crops on what you can expect for yield consequences. The uh, level of yield, you know, whether you're in the 9% or that 50% is really kind of depends on uh, how wet those conditions were and how deep and wide that compaction went. Because one of the things, strange things about compaction is that, you know, usually when we see a rut, we think, well, the compaction is underneath it. Well, it, it's just not only beneath it, it also bulges out to the sides and impacts the crop more that way too. And so... Um, you know, the uh, amount of yield consequence you get is kind of dependent on how wet that soil was when you drove over it and when the uh, ruts actually occurred, as well as that soil's ability to kind of heal itself. In the region where we're at here in the Red River Valley of North Dakota, we have soils that naturally crack. They're high in clay and they crack when it dries. And many soils don't have the clay mineralogy that let their soils naturally crack. Those types of soils will take just innately longer to heal than one that actually does crack. So if you've got cracks in your basement walls, your fields will actually heal themselves faster. That's also one of those give and takes of where you're at on the landscape. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.